Hello, everyone. I'm Mike, a member of Keystone and recent member of Lancaster here. Uh, I watch a lot of YouTube videos on turning. Some are good, some are not so good. Uh, one guy I kind of like, his name is Oliver Gomis, G-O-M-I-S. Does a lot of uh, segmented work. And uh, he showed how he makes a square bowl like this. Which camera would show it better? You're looking right at the see. one that's looking at you. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Barry, you can zoom in on that if you want. So, there we go. Like a bit much back out of it. There. there. So I followed his, the way he did it and made one. And it's like, well, that's okay. But if I was going to make a bunch of these, I'd cut it on a bandsaw, turn it, cut it on a bandsaw and turn them that way. But it did give me the idea that it's a great, method of turning other shapes this one you start out with a square but you don't have to start with a square and uh eventually you evolved into these multi-point turnings which are a lot of fun but it's the exact same process so i'm going to make the square one show you how to do that then i'm going to make a four point one uh the five point ones are really neat, but they're out of balance. And I don't think this lathe would handle it. It's a little bit lightweight. So we'll stick with the four point. So to start out, you have a centerpiece, which is your pattern. Uh, you draw the centers on the pattern, mark them on the sides, and then it gets glued between two blocks of wood. And you want to calculate that you have a cube. This is five inches this way, five inches this way. So I want to be five inches in thickness. So we got three quarters for the center. So it's whatever math works out for the sides. Now I make the outer pieces a little bit bigger than the center. So I can have some room for if the glue moves when I'm gluing it together. And uh, you get a piece like this. It's nice when they're bigger. And you can run them through a planer and get them nice and parallel or even pass them over a joiner. But a piece like this is too small for a planer, really not safe to run on a joiner. You just need one nice flat face that'll hold the glue. And I'm thinking, well, I could do a hand plane, and get it that way. Or if I had a big sander, I could do that. But then it's like, you know, I got a lathe. Why don't I use the lathe to make it flat? So I marked the center on the both sides. This is the drive I like to use. Can you zoom in on that? I use this for all my segmented work. It's just has no teeth or points or anything. It's just a friction drive and it matches the one way live center. And it's great that I can switch positions and go back and it's not all chewed up like a, like a spur would do. So we'll put that in. Ah. This ain't even the scary part of my demo. Then I just do a full cut. And we'll do a little scraping to smooth it out. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be smooth enough to get a glue joint. Let's see how we're doing. 
There it is. Thank you. <clears throat> well, needs a little bit more work, but you get the idea. I'll take a little bit. And that's flat enough to glue up. Now it does have that little bit of a raised area in the middle. And that I just clean up with a chisel. I'm gonna do it out of camera. Yeah, you go. Oh, wait till we get to the scary part. Don't cut toward your hand. Just don't. No, it's, I'm not jabbing like this. I got control, I'm holding it and it can't slip. And that'll be flat enough to glue. Now I, uh, I always use tight bond for glue. I guess you could use the CA glue, but I don't have a lot of experience. I'm a little bit afraid of the CA glue. I don't want it to let go while I'm turning because it could be exciting. So, no. You have the centers marked and they mark it on the edge. And I've used my uh, center punch and put a little dimple that helps line it up when you put it on the lathe. Now I just smear some glue on. I know there's glue left in the bottle because I spilled it on the floor. Get to bite the end open. I maybe. Cigar. Any cigar smokers in here? That's what it needed. Then for a spreader, I actually have a discount card I like to use to spread, but that's only good for about 20%. So I use my finger to get the rest. I probably only give 4%. And you kind of rub them together. I line the grains up that this grain's running this way and the outside block. I don't know if that matters. Maybe not. Same thing on the other side. Oh, wrong side. I cannot use a paper joint because you cut away so much in the process. You could use a paper joint, but there's no need because that's totally gone. It's not being it's going to be split on the paper. I actually cut them apart on a bandsaw after I turn them. So then you can clamp this or not. I usually let it sit overnight. Uh, a couple of things I found, if you don't have dry wood, uh, depending how wet it is, tight bond's not going to work. You may have to go to like Gorilla Glue or something because the tight bond won't dry in the center where it can't get any air to it. And the other thing is it could crack overnight. I've had them crack on me already. So I know at home I have a giant bag I put them in to keep them from uh, drying out too fast. And it uh, doesn't have to be giant. It could be Safeway or Hennings or Landis, whichever, wherever you get your bags. So uh, put them in and then you wait like 24 hours and you come out with a dry piece. the value of a live audience yes exactly that's why i don't like zoom i don't know if people are laughing or not well, they're, they're with you. are they okay yeah. oh we're laughing we're <laughs> laughing <laughs> we, wonder, we wonder why you brought the face shield but that's okay we know you use it later oh absolutely i do not turn these without a face shield because they still scare me 
it's just glued together. And if I didn't do a good job, it could fly apart. So now you mount it on the lathe. And this I'm is it in that center block. That in that block. center block, you see the point. Yeah. And I do with the grain first. I don't know if it matters. This is where we need the shield because unfortunately I left my glued up block at home. So this one's only been glued for about an hour and a half. And I'm not totally confident it's gonna to stay together. Sure. Yeah, let's bring back the shield just in case. <laughs> I'd hate to break something in here. <coughs> Mike, could you use some of that uh, specta tape, that double-sided sticky tape to do this instead of glue? Maybe, but that scares me more than the CA glue. See, these pieces are free. They're not held in the lathe except by the glue or the adhesive or whatever. That's good there. Here, here wipe it off. Here's a clean clean it. And uh, if the glue lets go, it's, it's going flying. You know, when the thing's in between pieces and it comes off, well, it kind of bounces around the floor and you don't get a lot of excitement out of it. But this could be dangerous. So I'm going to actually stand off to the side while I turn. But I actually want to show this process because you make one of these first and then everything else you do after that is just the same process with a different pattern in the middle. So now comes the face shield. That work? We can get rid of it after this piece is turned. Yeah, that looks good. Apart. The glare is gone. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to stand off to the side when I turn it on. And if it flies apart. So far, so good. Don't clap yet. Now it's just like turning a square block round. There's no special cuts other than I'm going real light. And you're using a regular bowl gouge, that looks like, yeah? I'm just using a regular bowl gouge. You could actually use a roughing gouge on this. You're turning with the grain. It helps when the tool rest doesn't move. And I can actually kind of see the solid center looking in the end so I know how deep to go. What's the RPM? Uh, this is as slow as this lathe goes. What is that? 600, I think, 500. Okay. Mike, you're not turning the cylinder around here. You're just going to the waste block, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I was asking if you were turning it around or just going to the waste block. Uh, it'll be both. both. When I get to the waste block, it will be round. But yeah, the waste block is my guide. So you're not leaving the waste block square. You're actually going to turn a radius on it. Uh, no, I'm going to stop when I get to the waste block. I guess technically it won't be perfectly round. Yeah, so that's what I meant. Flat. Boy, I think I'm getting brave. I'm going to turn the speed up a little bit. All right, maybe I won't.
There it goes. Still going to stand off to the side. Boy, I don't like the way that's sounding. Let's see if it's coming loose. No, it's just I got a crack in the wood, but that'll get turned away. That crack was in there when I made the block, so. see how we're doing. All right, I still got a little bit to go. Which camera are you on? We're looking at you from the tailstock in. Okay, you can see there's a little bit to go. I'm not all the way flat. I'm getting close at this end, so I can concentrate more on the headstock end. I'm still not there all the way. As you can see, I'm a little bit off center on my points. I've got a lot here and almost none there. It'll work out. So now we're gonna turn it 90 degrees and do the other turning. I leave a little bit to clean up because there's gonna be a lot of tear out when I do this. Again, stand off to the side when I first start it. And there you can see the tear out where it comes around and is just hitting that end grain. But uh, that'll get cleaned up as I get closer to the finish size. Had the legs stopped, I should move the tool rest in. A lot of times people move the tool rest with the lathe running. I do it myself when the piece is round, but there's too many flats on this to do that. If the piece is round and you bump it, it just makes a scrape, but this could be a disaster. Tighten the tailstock a little bit if it slips. I'm getting close, there's less tear out. So now I'm gonna move the tool rest in a little bit. Now I'm gonna drop the handle of the tool and use that wing on an on a angle and take a light pass that way and it'll get rid of this tear out.
All right, we're getting pretty close. As you can see, the tear out is not much there. We got this tear out on this side, but that's why I didn't finish turn. I'll switch it around and return that side and that'll get rid of that. And I'm just turning a straight, you know, nothing fancy. So we're just about there. I'll go a little more. You also want to start watching the center on the bottom. You want these to come to a point. And yes, I turn the lathe off a lot to inspect. So now I'm going completely around here. But I'm going to switch back to my original setup and uh, clean up that side. You're holding your gouge with the flute fairly flat or open. I'm holding it down and I'm rubbing the bevel, the bevel, not the bevel, right below that point. So it's catching it on a, on a steep angle and it gives a light cut. Almost like sheer scraping. Where if I turn the flute towards the wood, it'd be sheer scraping it. This is where having that smooth drive center is nice that I can switch back and forth and it doesn't tear up that center part. Is this the one I want to do? Yeah. Same thing here, nice shear cut. Sometimes you got to go the other way. And you see the tear out's almost all gone. I got a little bit there. This piece is actually just about, I got a little bit there. This is where the smoother you turn, the less sanding there is to do. And that's kind of important because you don't want to sand this with the lathe spinning. Even if you could do it, you're going to round over these points, these corners. And that kind of detracts from the bowl. At least I think so. So the tear out's almost all gone. So to sand them, you just... Uh, you know, just a piece of sandpaper and you sit there and watch TV and sand away. Uh, I know when I sand, I always like to start at 220. That way I'm done by three o'clock. All right, as you see, I went a little bit past the center. So now I'm gonna clean up this side again and get back to where I'm coming to a point. I don't think it really matters which one I turn first because I'm going back and forth, back and forth.
and that's pretty good. A um, little bit of tear on the corners. Uh, I could spend more time turning it, but you don't need to see that. Uh, that's basically the turning for the outside. Like I said, you can sand it now or you can wait and turn the inside and sand it because you're going to do it in your lap either way. So the next step is I take this over to the bandsaw and I'm going to cut it in half. So I have two pieces. All right, now I got two halves. So uh, to finish those, you do them one at a time. So you end up with a bowl for yourself and another one for your best friend. Take this off for a minute. Put my hat back. Still on. waiting, Mike. So now to do this, I mark the center. And you can cut the center kind of from the center points where you went in, but you want to make sure that is the center center. It could have changed depending on how it crushes into the wood. And the most important part on this bowl is you want these four sides to be identical. They have to be perfect to the eye because everybody will notice if they're off and some people will say it and other people are nice enough to not mention it, but everybody will see it. So like I say, it's these four things. So the way I do that is I mark where the center is supposed to be and then I use a compass and I double check to make sure I'm right. That's why you see the circle drawn there. So I know that's my center point. And again, I'm gonna mark it with a, with a punch. Where's my hammer? Where's my hammer? Just makes it easier. Now there's a couple ways you can finish this. I could put it on the lathe, turn a flat or, or a tenon to grab it with a chuck, but then you end up with a flat bottom on the bowl. And I much prefer round bottoms, so I do it a little bit different. Is there any secret oh, to how you support that blank in the vacuum chuck? Off? Or actually make a square cutout to fit on my vacuum chuck that'll hold the bowl. Or I also have this fixture that'll hold it. So that is going to be grabbed in a talon chuck. It's going to take me a second to switch this to a chuck. If I can get my center out, they don't have a hole in the end of this lathe for knocking out the center. I guess we don't need no stinking hole. And that was a good question. Any uh, any special hand, hand uh, holding of that as you're band sawing it? What kind of jig do you hold it with? Uh oh. I hope I don't hit the motor, or else we're done for. I didn't even think of that. Thank you. John, can you guys hear us? We may be okay. It would be much better if this was mounted on a face plate rather than in a chuck, especially the chuck like the talon that has the teeth on the jaws because you're gonna get a little bit different hold every time you put it in. But I think we'll be close enough. Boy, I had it all set up and I got to actually take these out to begin with. There's people out there are asking you questions. And, uh, I don't hear no questions. Can they yeah. put them in the chat and you can relay them? Yeah, I can do that. Mike, that works. Mike Junker is that. How did he hold the piece to the bandsaw? Uh, with my hands. I just balance it on the How to hold the piece in the band saw is I just balance it on this center part and push it through the blade. Um, 
haven't really had any issues with it. I guess you could make a fixture to hold it if you're. I can think of safer ways, but. I nothing. see nothing dangerous about it. Now, is there other questions out in the room that I'm not getting? I'm going to move the spotlight, go to a gallery view so we can see. Does anybody out there want to wave their hand and ask a question? Okay, if you put questions in the chat, I will relay them to uh, the light. We don't need the handle. All right, I'm in my center point and I'm on the thing, but I want to make sure that I'm not tilted. And the way I do that is I use a pointer in the full rest and I watch where it comes to the, to the point. So it looks like this side here and this one are a little bit out. That's really close. And here it doesn't have to be perfect because nobody will see this. What is sliding? <clears throat> you don't mind if I hammer on your lathe, do you? No. All right, before I put my holders with the bolts in, I got to clean off this piece of poplar that I had for a center. Depending on how you did gluing, this can come off in pieces. So I'm going to put the face shield back on. Maybe we'll turn the tool rest into a more useful orientation. Just a simple pull cut to get rid of that center pattern. See there, went a piece. See what we got. Out there, the Karen wonders whether the jam chuck is marring the center of the bowl. No, I have a piece of, I have a piece of a neoprene to cushion it. Plus, it isn't sanded yet, so this is a little bit loose. So I'm going to pry that off with a chisel rather than have it fly off in pieces. All right, now I can clean up with the face, which is going to be this outside edge. There it is, the outside edge of the bowl. So I'm going to grab a sharper gouge.
it's not too bad. I think I cleaned that up a little bit. Oh, I forgot to do something. I'm going to actually take the tailstock away and I'm going to put these holders in. Look at that line swirl. You want the points to be in the center of your holder. And I just got lucky because I didn't look at that when I first mounted it. So what's the power ball up to? I think I got to play that tonight. So we'll get closer. And again, take a nice light cut. One thing that's important doing this kind of work is you got these points flying around. So you stay on your side of the tool rest and the wood will stay on its side of the tool rest and you'll be okay. If you're reaching over, you could end up with a nasty cut on your hand. And uh, at least at home, I know I have a stapler that if I do cut myself, I can actually staple it closed. Haven't got to use it yet, but I'm hopeful that someday. All right, that's pretty good. Um, this you could actually sand with the lathe running. Now, one last step is to hollow out the inside. This is where I use my holders. And it looks like they're going to miss the motor, so yay for me. When I made this face plate and laid it out, I actually drew circles where I was going to drill my holes. And I drilled the holes exactly the same for each piece, and the pieces are all the same. So it isn't that you have to find the right position for the right piece of wood. They each go anywhere. And there's extra holes in there for different shapes. I've used this for five-sided, seven-sided. Whatever, you just need something to go across the points. There's a fourth one around somewhere. I see it. It's under my bowl.
Then we just snug them up. We don't have to make them too tight. This is actually captured fairly well inside here that it's not really going anywhere. Plus, if you over tighten one more than another, you could actually throw it off. That's why I don't use the power drill to tighten these. Now we can get the tail stock out of the way. I get rid of the little elbow jabber. Probably should have just taken the whole tail stock off. <laughs> you got to watch you don't hit the bolts with the tool rest. Uh, and this is just like turning any other bowl. I keep looking because something's bouncing around here. I don't know if it's the headstock or the chuck. That little pull's too slow. I think the headstock came loose. Yeah, I think so. That's better. And we'll stop and we'll see how close we're getting. And you want to check your thickness, you know, in the flat. So and go a little bit deeper, but then we're going to stop. Ah, now that messed it up.
Did everybody see what I did there? I had a run back. I touched the bowl without having the tool on its side and it caught and it came back at me. That was just being careless on my part. So I'd have to fix that. But it's not real bad. Just got some tear out. And that's how you do it carefully. <laughs> now it's just a question of sanding. I lost my screwdriver. All my tools behind me are in a big pile. You'd think I was at home. I do. Yes. Say what that question was again. Say it, just stay in the room. You're good. Uh, I asked Mike, does he ever use a bowl scraper? Uh, especially given the shape of the inside here. I don't think it'd be I actually brought my bowl scraper. I actually use two different scrapers. I have my regular scraper and I have my negative rake scraper. Difference is the regular one I use on a downward angle. And it's really good for cleaning up the bottom of the bowl up to where it just starts to go up the side. The negative rake scraper is used flat on the tool rest and it's great for up these sides just to clean them up. And here I would actually sand the inside while it's on the lathe, but nobody wants to watch sanding. I always grind the top side. Oh, okay. The top side first and the lower side. I bet the table mics are live. Not sure if it makes a difference, but I think I'm getting rid of the old burr by grinding at the top. And then I grind the bottom and put the new burr on. But that's my reasoning. I really like the way you have the bars instead of the traditional donut shop because the corners are so important to the piece. It oh. makes sense to have those bars that lets you uh, still see and visualize the corners. What is that? Are the black lines where I'm actually gripping it at the point. 
exact same process, it's just one more clue. You make an eight sided template, you get an eight sided bowl. You put a design on the edge, and you end up with something like this eight sides. Or a little box, you put little half circles, and you end up with a bowl like this. Exact same process, just more, more moves. And it really gets fun when you start doing odd numbers. The four sided one you can make looks like a star. Going to turn this if I had to, but then the stars have five points instead of four. So making the five side, it's the same process, but your centers are a little bit different. I found the best way. Thank you. Is you do a five sided layout? Oh wait, upside down. That didn't make no sense. So anyway, you got the five sided layout. And uh, after all these lines, what you really need, you draw a circle and you need the five points. And then I just take a, a circle template, I ain't gonna look for it, and just call, mark it off. And uh, you cut these pieces off. This gets glued between the blocks of wood but you save these pieces. You number these pieces A, B, C, D, E because you use these for uh, putting your centers. This point is the center of the circle, but for the center of my turning, I wanna measure from here to here and get the center of that. And that actually is right here. And if I take the two pieces, B and E, now those centers are here. My sticky tape ain't holding. So now I got those two centers. And these pieces actually allow me to put it between my drive and my live center, and it spins like this. Well, actually, it would spin this way. Hold that view back a little bit. You're too like tight. Like I say, you use these to hold it. I actually put a screw in temporary. That's what the extra holes are for. And you turn one side, then you switch them out. Oh, where's the piece? And then I go to the other center would be from here to here. And you go with each one. And when this point, I turn to this point, I'm also just almost touching here. And that's how you get the five sided shape. You don't have to be that. You can turn them non-symmetrical and you get different patterns. Uh, it's limitless what you can do with this, but it's a really interesting process where you're turning to a pattern. And that's basically what I have to show. Uh, any other questions? Was the, uh, the first square, the poplar in between those pieces, do you need that as a template for a square? You need that for your centers to go into, Mike. Oh, I have done this up to 16 sided. Um, very time consuming to go to that many different positions. Uh, Mike. What's really neat is depending on whether you go in or out, you get different patterns on the box. All right, well, Ron, you just answered that that's where your centers are going to be to drive it. Do you technically need that? You can actually use centers if you have a wide well, enough what board, do do it? thick enough board, you could just put your centers Jump in. 
You could do, Mike, you could do the square without the poplars, yeah. but you'd have to stop, obviously, sh well short of center. You'd have to mark it out, you know, three quarters of an inch or something. The, the question was, why did you actually need the poplar for the square box? You technically don't. Technically don't, but it shows the process. Very and good. Thank you. Two by saw, he did it that way. He made a pattern, and that just... You know, I said, well, it don't have to be square. It can be anything. It can be a design. They don't even have to map from side to side. You just have to switch your centers. And you're only turning, you know, I could turn all four sides different by just offsetting the center that I'm only hitting one side. I, I, I think the effect of putting the, pop, uh, putting the spacer in between makes it more attractive because you can see that the radius on the curve does not point to a center, it points to some right. off object or point in space. And let me just that was my first message. And the first question I asked was exactly to help define the radius. And if not, was it necessary? But that we talked amongst ourselves in the gallery, so we solved all the problems of the world. Great. <laughs> Great. Like okay. just one more comment I'll make. I use poplar because I'm cheap and poplar is cheap but it's not the best choice. Uh, when I do my, put it between the two centers and I crank the tailstock in, sometimes one side will sink in further than the other. So uh, I think the better system would be maybe use a maple that doesn't crush as much as the poplar because poplar gets so, you get hard spots and soft spots in the poplar. And that actually throws the point off on the bottom. Mike, I did two of these different bowls. I did an eight and a 12 side. Great. And I used an oak plate in between. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would work. Like I say, poplar wasn't the best choice I found, but it's what I got. And I'm going to use it until I use it up. So I'll just struggle. Is, uh, is MDF too... Uh, MDF is just too nasty. Pokey. It's just nasty. I hate MDF. Uh, MDF might work. I haven't tried it. I, I doubt that MDF would work. It'll chew out. It hey, can might. you guys can you guys show us the chuck top and bottom? Can you pull that off the uh, the lathe there and show us where your neoprene is? Okay. It's just a circle of plywood. Uh, I made it to grab it a chuck so I can take it around. I should have a. A faceplate would be better because it would be more true every time you mount it. But I hollow, I dished out the center just to help it align, and then put a piece of neoprene in it, just an old mouse pad. Or if you got an old wetsuit laying around, you can cut a piece out of that and use that. But just something that's not going to mar the, the bowl. And other things, real quick, you still got five minutes? Sure. I used to have a couple of those with a donut hole in the back, used them to turn the bottoms on the bowls. You could pull the clamps up on them. Yeah, that would work. This actually fits on a one-way vacuum drum. They turned it just out of a piece of pine or something, whatever I had. Then I cut out a six-sided shape, and that's how I vacuumed my six-sided bowl. I put some piece, you know, a little bit of foam around here. And, uh, it's easier than using my chuck. As you see, the chuck's a little fiddly to get it just right. Um, this works well. You start getting 10, 12 different points. That's a lot of cutting. Then I go back to my using my face plate. Uh, all depends on the situation. What do you do with the bottoms there, Mike, with all those? the uh, facets coming together? Uh, take a piece of sandpaper and just sand it so it sits nice and rocks nice. I like bowls that rock. I don't turn flat bottoms on my bowls. Yeah, the first ones I did, I had a, a tenon on the bottom so I could hollow the inside. Yes. The second ones I did, I hollowed the inside first. Okay. And then glued them to the, to the center divider and then turned them to a the shape. <laughs> Okay, that's that's an interesting way. Were you able to keep it centered on the on your inside turning? 
that would be my only concern with that. But that's actually yeah. I, t I turned his shoulder on my divider, the oak huh? divider in the middle, slipped him yeah. onto the shoulder, and actually I glued him with a paper joint between them. Okay. And before I got the last one cut, they were starting to come off. Ah, okay. Yeah, this scared me a little bit with the not sitting overnight, but it seemed to hold together okay. But uh, I didn't see, figure on. I didn't figure on bandsawing them apart afterwards, so that was. Uh, that's what I, That's what I saw this guy on YouTube did. So I just followed his method, and then I improved on it. Or at least I think I improved on it to get different shapes. Watch yours, I didn't see any, anybody doing it before. I saw your your bowls, and I thought, how the hell did you do that? So I figured it out. Hey, a lot of fun. It's it really like, interesting to hollow the inside first. I've never even thought of that. Uh, yeah, I was disappointed when you walked away and didn't show us how you did that. <laughs> got one made anyway. Okay. Okay. I actually sold a couple of them. You bought them there, Ron? Uh, no, I sold them at our craft fair in November. That's great. Yeah, especially the odd numbered ones. Everybody, how did you do the odd number? Well, it took a little figuring, but again, it's just you got to lay out your center pattern, figure out where you want the center axis to be, and go from there. Is there is there a reason why your odd numbered ones are at least the five point one that you showed? The sides, if you will, are concave instead of flat. Like here with hexagonal and the square, it's a straight line. It's a more star looking. Yeah, this one was, you know, as I'm doing it, okay, and it's like, well, this is kind of boring. Let's let's try and jazz it up a little bit, make it more of a star. Did you make a nine-sided one? I think you mentioned that you did. I might have. And I got to thinking about. How the hell do you do a nine? And so I did an eight. <laughs> yeah. You go on YouTube and you look up, unless you remember a high school geometry class, how to draw a nine-sided, whatever that would be, monogon inside a circle. And you draw it out. And you can draw it on a piece of paper and glue that to your pattern, or you can just draw it right on your poplar, maple, whatever you're using as a pattern, and then cut it out. Glue the wood together and uh, go from there. I think you could do almost any any shape. <sighs> well, Ted, Ted Wagnerson in our club turns a diagonal uh, bowl with a, uh, a traditional, you know, wooded with a, an elaborate finial. And I thought the, uh, the the odd number with the straight sides is a very attractive bowl. But his kind of okay just goes down to a flat bottom on the. Okay, no, that's, that's yes. Like I said, there's so much can be done with this. Yeah. I've only just started this, and I'm already looking for something else to do. I get bored too quick. So, yeah, I did that. Let's do something else. Do a two sided one. A two, I did a three sided one. I didn't show that one. I did a three sided bowl. But everybody goes, oh, you turned that out of a cube. No, I didn't. <laughs> I turned it out of a triangle. And that one rocks too. Of course. Of course, they all do. It spins kind of neat. It's just the way you rock, Mike. It is. It's the way I roll. <laughs> now, Barry's challenge is to make one with 3.1416 sides. There you go. There you go. Why do you one side decimals? I got to make a one sided one. <laughs> nope, I'm not going to Yeah. That was really very, very interesting. It was that. Yeah, it was the great to see that. Do, I think anybody in the club can do. It's really nothing difficult. You're turning a square to a round. Yeah. But as Ron says, if you don't know how it's done, you don't know how it's done, you know? Well done here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you again, Mike. You may have the spotlight. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for uh, bearing with us tonight. Um, hopefully, we'll be back live in person uh, next month, but uh, we'll wait and see how things go with COVID.
And uh, just a reminder, next month's challenge is the salt and pepper. And we uh, are reminding you to uh, turn your big stands. So thanks again, and we will see you next month.